I, my big picture idea in, is that uh, much of my research can be thought about uh, with the, uh, the, the name that I've given it called the membership's theory of inequality. And what I mean by that is that one of the perspectives on inequality is to ask about how individuals across the life course become members of different groups. So one of them is almost a triviality. A baby is a member of a thing called a family. Other factors are, are more naturally social. In other words, you think about residential neighborhoods. One thinks about schools. One thinks about higher education. And then there's a final uh, type of membership, which is where one is located in, in, a, in, a, in a firm. I mean, obviously, it matters who you work with, what the nature of the organization is, et cetera. And so my vision uh, in the research that I have and am pursuing on integration mobility is to try to understand the role of social factors. I'm Stephen Durloff. I'm a professor of economics at the University of Wisconsin and co-director of the Human Capital Econ and Economic Opportunity Initiative Global Working Group, which uh, the Institute for New Economic uh, Thinking has sponsored. A perspective on why parental income helps determine offspring income would be the parents make investments. Okay, you enrich the, the home. You buy books, computers, tutors, so on and so forth. The social perspective, which is where my work has been and is, is focusing on how, how uh, parents shape uh, the social environment in which children function. And there, that would be a focus, obviously, on residential neighborhoods, which are going to generate role models and peer effects, the types of schools that children have access to, and as consequences, what happens in terms of uh, the types of colleges they go to, et cetera. So I put that on the table as a, uh, as a perspective on understanding inequality. From my perspective, of taking the, the membership's theory as, as a positive and empirically relevant theory of inequality, the implication in a very broad sense is that, uh, that the mechanism, the mainspring for a lack of mobility is segregation, very broadly defined. And so from the perspective of, this, of the theory, as it were, it matters that neighbor, the extent to which neighborhoods are segregated by ethnicity as well as income. And so focusing on income, you can see that because of uh, the relationship between local public finance and, and, uh, and school resources, that you have a, a direct mapping, as it were, from the distribution of incomes in a, in a school district in this case and, and what's available to the students. The distribution of adults in a community determines the role models to which children are experiencing, experience so on and so forth. And so in my, my judgment is that from the neighborhood's perspective, the, the message is that thinking about redistribution, redistributive policies ought to move beyond, I'll say, the conventional policy of redistributing income to what I metaphorically will call redistributing memberships, which is, a, is, is, a, is a, a, a cutesy way to say that when we think about the, the, the zoning restrictions, the laws that, that determine the composition of housing in a community, that that's an instrument that can, will engage in redistribution. There is, and uh, similarly, uh, requirements that there be uh, uh, multifamily housing and new developments. That f those are simply two uh, ideas that are associated with the notion of trying to promote economic uh, integration across communities. And there is, again, there's some you know, very powerful recent uh, work on an experiment called Moving to Opportunity that found very la large long-run consequences to, uh, uh, in this experiment, moving poor families to lower poverty neighborhoods. And so I would put very broadly, segregation is the uh, source of it, and therefore it's policies that re uh, reduce se segregation along many dimensions are the, uh, are the solution. My vision of where economics should be going with respect to inequality research, uh, you know, to be a little concrete, is integrating broader conceptions of, of human beings, which operationally means introducing ideas from psychology and sociology into economic models. And so I'm uh, an unabashed admirer of the formalism of economic theory. It allows for the demonstration of a logical coherence, the calculation of when general equilibrium effects will be different from the intuitions we have about an individual, et cetera. But the, util the value of the theory, I don't want to use the word utility twice, is, not, is going to be delimited the extent to which the behavioral assumptions for the individuals are at variance with, with the, uh, the nature of how people behave. Now, there is an important caveat to that, which is that when one is thinking about populations, 
there's this idea that you would start by modeling individuals, how they make decisions, then you ask about the aggregate consequences. So it is possible in certain contexts that the assumptions which are invalid at the individual level aggregate out, so to speak. Okay, so I put that on the, uh, as the caveat because that leads to agent-based modeling uh, versus complexity and other, other types of methods. Well, I think there's a role for agent-based modeling. So as I, I've been critical of it in, in, in my writings, but it is because the tool is being associated with weak descriptions of individual behavior. And so the fact that one can model hetero, the virtue of agent-based modeling is one doesn't have to solve equations. One can basically allow the computer to work at a high dimensional environment, which kind of sounds like lots of people interacting, and see what, what, what sort of properties are, uh, are found. And so the extent to which I have been critical is that uh, one of the main dimensions of, 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 uh, of a limitation is that much of the work has, I think, poor behavioral foundations. Now, an answer to that is, well, you know, why are they any better than in neoclassical economics? I think that's not the right way to ask that question. That's not an interesting comparison. And what I mean by that is that agent-based models often impose f forms of bounded rationality that are not credible. And so if one wants to critique the rationality assumptions in economics, I think they have to be ones that reflect what's known from the behavioral economics literature, what's reflected more broadly from the psychology literature as opposed to choosing uh, forms of bounded rationality that allow for the analysis, letting the computer do something relatively simply. Now again, I don't, you know, it's, I don't want to damn a literature that's evolving, but that's kind of a general critique. My view is that agent-based modeling is an example of, of a tool that asks the following question, and that is, is more different. In other words, and uh, put, and what I mean by that is an off, a criticism to, you know, slightly digress of some macroeconomics, or much of macroeconomics, has been that it works with representative agent models. So it doesn't respect the heterogeneity that it's a large population that's, uh, in, you know, making choices and generating accurate unemployment rates, et cetera. What I would say with respect to inequality is that my, my, uh, my holy grail with respect to methods are tools that allow us to model heterogeneity across individuals in a rich way, but in a sufficiently structured way that we can generate meaningful statements about objects such as the aggregate poverty rate, the rate of non-marital fertility, the rate of participation in, the, uh, in criminal activity, et cetera. And so the t set of mo tools that I have been most con interested in actually come from statistical mechanics. So they come from physics where uh, a sort of a, a question, as an example, is how, do, how does one think about what a, what a, a ferromagnet is, a ma magnet in nature? And it has to do with a, a piece of iron where the, the spins have tipped one way or the other. There's a, there's a family resemblance to that in the statement that a community has developed social norms where people are adhering to the norm. Now, it's a family resemblance, and so the, uh, the devil's in the details, which is to write down models, in other words, that use the mathematics from statistical mechanics which are beautiful in terms of translating specifications of heterogeneous objects into aggregate properties. And it's not just a matter that it allows us to have micro foundations that respect heterogeneity, it's also a matter that there are interesting phenomena called emergent phenomena that can occur. And so a magnet's an emergent phenomena, it's not a property of one uh, uh, iron, uh, iron atom, it's a property of a bunch of them. Similarly, the object called ice is not a property of a single water molecule, it's a property of the way the water molecules are, are interconnected. And so again, my vision of, if you want to talk about something like a poverty trap, is that it's going to be something that emerges from the situations associated with the economics of the place combined with the interactions associated with, with, a, with the given location. And so that's, and so, I think that, that, that that's an example, for, at least for me, so, you know, speaking simply from my research, that has been a very powerful source of methodologies, and it's one that I think that uh, you know, still, has, uh, it still only has the toe in the water, so to speak, in terms of using economics.